Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. I rise with your leave to bring the debate on the Public Accounts Committee bill to an end. And hopefully, by the time we are through, the full house would have endorsed this, what the member for number six described as a historic bill and a historic moment. By the time we would have finished, I am sure reasons would have prevailed on the opposite benches. At times it would appear from the feedback we are getting from the public that members opposite are not good at reasoning. Because the bill is so clear, and because the moment is so historic that we and this side have seized it, and we are offering the country the best piece of legislation at this moment in time, as we have committed to do. The worrying thing is that as you listen to members opposite, name them, member for number three, member for number six, member for number two, the senator and the member from Nevis, 11. Eleven. You wondered, is this a case you know, Sirain, three blind mice. Now, it's four members there, but the analogy, they all run up to the farmer's wife, it was, cut off the tail with a carving knife. Did you ever see such a thing as three or four blind mice? Because none of them would depart from their stubborn obstinacy with relation to the particular bill. None of them would want to heed advice with respect to the bill. And none of them, after years in government, save the member for number three, who has not been, and if he continues along that path, will never be part of a government. None of them showed any understanding of the processes of government. How could the member number six in particular, who led a government continuously for 20 years, come now to criticize a new administration which is doing what in his view is a historic piece of legislation moving through the parliament, which he says at the end of committee stage, we could all seize the moment. They let the Public Accounts Committee to be non-functional for 20 years. They saw nothing wrong with that. They saw no urgency to respond. He, as the leader, the member for number six, as a leader of the administration, didn't consider it important enough to say that this is a fundamental matter to do with our democracy, our functioning, and I am going to take leadership. As far as he was concerned, just name the team. Name the team. And if the team has no gears, doesn't matter. I've named the team. Is that responsible leadership for a modern era? Is that something that the member for number six feels comfortable to put before a thoughtful and thinking population of St. Kitts and Nevis in 2017 that so long 
as he comes to the parliament and go through the charade, the mockery, the sham of naming members to the team. It doesn't matter how the team plays. Name the team. It doesn't matter if St. Kitts Patriots make one or zero. The coach, the captain, none of them accept any responsibility because we have named the team. How could that stand? How could that stand as a responsible position? Never once did he call the leader of the opposition or whoever chaired and say, what can we do to make it work? Never once did he do that, Mr. Speaker, in 20 years. Never once did he, took a, did he take a serious look at the document he said dated 1992? Was around since the time. He has knowledge of it. He clamored prior to 95 about the non-functioning of the Public Accounts Committee. It was a manifesto commitment then, and nothing happened. He was peeved when the Honorable Member for Nevis, 10, is the Premier, 10, was made the chairperson of the Public Accounts Committee. He said, look at that. It should be him. So he was a member of the committee. He knew the experience of the non-functioning and the constraints on the committee. And when he was elevated to a position from which he could have done something, he chose for 20 years, 20 long years to do nothing. And he comes here now making what some have described as hypocritical sounds about concern for a public accounts committee that he allowed, he allowed to not to function for 20 years. All the reforms he wants now in the law. He had 20 years too long at the crease and did nothing. And so his presentation is simply that. The presentation which we must this notice because of the hypocrisy in the air to which he made reference to. Because he lacks the moral authority to present the case after 20 years of inactivity of the Public Accounts Committee. 20 years. 20 years had been long enough. And so I asked him, 20 years of nothing, we come to do something. Isn't something better than nothing? They prefer to have a public accounts committee that is non-functioning, non-functional, without the resources to function, and let that state of play holds for 20 years rather than to have something starting to work. Let us develop a practice. I felt ashamed for my former leader and member for number six when he could stand, stand before the nation as he did a moment ago to say, that there is a practice in this country, a practice in that country, as if he just come. But he was there for 20 years, one of the longest serving leaders. And he did nothing. And he did nothing because that was his preference. In contrast, we are showing that we want something to be done. And we have come to the parliament and we are doing something. Something. So we are doing better than they ever could. And it appears over there 
that ignorance is bliss in opposition. Ignorance is bliss. That is why you hear them come and they belittle and they decry the audit accounts. They have no meaning if you listen to them. The DA say it's only some graph and pictorials. That's what they say. That's what was said over there. Another member went on to say, member for number two. Well, she is astonishing in her ignorance. <laughs> member two said there are no programs in the audit report, just totals. And so I asked the question, where has the member for number two been for all these years? That she served as a speaker of the National Assembly, that she served as a minister of the government, did she not read for once, once upon a time, an audit report, so that she can speak sensibly about it? So that when the novice member for number three speaks with ignorance about the audit report, about it being pictorials and graphs, that some as it were to nothing, she could correct him from that misrepresentation. So I wondered, and I have a couple of the reports. They came, not caring what they will say today, you know. This is the pattern of the opposition. No wonder they are there. They are there where they are now. Because it's a case, good morning, ma'am, cabbage, ma'am. Always, of course. So we look, for example, to the audit report, 2010. Only graphs and pictorials. Uh, they have some of those things, but they have more. When the member for number two says, but there are no programs, Member for number two clearly has never read a director of audit report, and you don't have to go back too far to confront the ignorance of the member for number two. This is a director of audit report for the year ended 31st December 2010. At page 10, subheading 3.4 program results. Yet she comes to the parliament and says, well, what are we going to get from auditing the report? There's nothing in it. There are no programs, but the programs are always listed in the audit report. 2010, go closer to the end game. 2014, look at it. Program results, page 11. And we could go on and on in relation to these audit reports. Same pattern, clearly for her to come and to make that sort of presentation is an indication that she hasn't read it and the member for number three certainly is no better. That is the tale of the three blind mice. See how they run. Because all of them in sequence, number three, number six, the senator, the member for Nevis, nine, I think he is, hmm? 11, all of them ran into the same trap. All of them, all of them made helpless by their inability to try to understand the processes of what is taking place in the parliament. And then the member for number two thought she came upon a good score. A good score in the budget for 2015, I think she said. What it is was so enlightening to her. She said that the director of audit was making her point. Let me see if I have my own. Page seven, Public Accounts Committee. You know, somewhere in the Book of Acts, there's a passage somewhere down, verses 30-something, they are 
preachers and good Catholics like Senator Phipps here help guide me. What was the fundamental issue? Do you understand what you read? How can I, unless somebody guide me, who over there is guiding whom in their presentation? Who over there is guiding them so ignorance does not become bliss on the opposition side? The National Audit Office has been operating for decades, you know? For decades without a public accounts committee, an indictment on them. So she passes over that. No, no, no. A PAC is a joint committee of members of parliament comprising members of the government and their position. Truism. One of its primary functions is to examine, yes. to examine the reports of the director of audit. But what were their argument over there? Don't tell us about no director of audit report. Give us wide scope. We don't want no audit report. Wide scope. Other functions may include accountability, oversight of government programs and accounts, and oversight of the activities and functions of the National Audit Office. It is our endeavor to re-establish a functioning pack. But what it is the legislation is attempting to do, just what the Director of Audit says under the subhead of PAC, it is our endeavor to re-establish a functioning PAC because she has pointed to the reality that the National Audit Office has been operating for decades, at least two decades. 20 years without a PAC, functioning PAC. That is the reality which we, are inher we have inherited, and that is what we are attempting to do by this legislation. So they're clearly not understanding what they read, not understanding it. No programs, but programs in every audit report. They said it's only charts and so on, but if they read it, they would see it is much more. They says that the audit report has no performance. Nice words are just here being banded about without seeking guidance as to their relevance and applicability and history in the context of St. Kitts and Nevis. No performance report. Because clearly, ignorance is bliss over there. No research. Because if they were to look to the audit report of December 31st, 2012, right there, you have in it spelled out on page 20, 21, 22, 23, the performance audit done at the school meals program. And yet they said, we're not doing those things. They want those, but they are part of the audit report. The auditor does them from time to time. And according to the Constitution, none of us over here can direct the audit in the performance of your duties. That is reality. So we can't get up tomorrow and say, go, go, go. I direct you. You are ordered to go do a performance audit of value for money. That is in the discretion of the director of audit. Right. That is a sensible person there. Okay. That is a professional accountant there who would have been trained and exposed to these things. Who would understand that there is a need from time to time for the audit interventions of this nature. So they clearly are not up to date. They clearly are not interested in a search for truth. And then somewhere in one of the reports also, just how diversified they are, you know, 
One of the reporters, I think it is 2013, spends a lot of time there about an audit conducted at the embassy in Taiwan. None of these things the member have seen because the member is not interested in what is happening in the parliament. She just comes. Morning, ma'am. Cabbage, ma'am. No matter what the matter we are discussing. So we are discussing public accounts committee and they will take us into a discussion of irrelevancies. They want to take us into a discussion of the, um, yes, Director of Audit Report 2013, Audit of the Taiwanese Embassy. We have to bring one here about the audit of the mission in Washington, D.C. and what the findings are. And it tells you the scope. It gives you general information regarding the embassy. It gives recommendations, and people are asking about recommendations. It gives observations. It gives the concerns of the ambassador, and all of these things. So I'm not too sure which world they live. No programs and programs are there. Graphs are there to dramatize and crystallize the point of the movement. And then she found something sweet, she said, in a cursory glance of one of the reports. And she said, you know what? They made a deficit. How dare they made a deficit? When year after year from 1995, go to the audit report, it was deficit after deficit under the administration. First time in the history of the past administration, a surplus was made, was under my watch as the Minister of Finance. First time, first time. And she comes, and she comes, and she comes, and she comes. And you hear how ignorance is bliss? Because what better example of a government that did not pay people than a government that unilaterally imposed a haircut. It is over a hundred million dollars of debt. The Douglas administration did not pay National Bank. It's over 80 million dollars of debt. The Douglas government did not pay the Social Security. It is millions of dollars in debt. The Douglas government did not pay the Methodist Church. It was millions of dollars in debt that the Bank of Scotia contested with this government. So don't call me that. Don't call me that. That is debt unpaid. And they call it a haircut. A haircut. A haircut. Haircut. This is what it is. Haircut, Mr. Speaker. That is the reality. And indeed, talking about non-payment, the budget director sent this to me in response to Marcella's claim that there was a deficit. Member for number two. Please find attached a table listing the appropriation warrant signed by you in 2015 in respect of extraordinary budgetary expenditure, which incurred in 2014 under that administration. These total $82.3 million. $82.3 million, which I have to account for. I had to release the money for in 2015, $82.3 million. And then they dare to talk about there was a deficit caused by them, caused by the not paying in 2014 for commitments undertaken and undertaken without the benefit of the oversight of the parliament. This is what it is. This is what it is to cover travel expenses for members of the parliament. The travel that did not clear their subsistence. They didn't do it. 
to cover additional funds required to meet rental expenses to the house of the new resident judge. They did not pay it to provide for additional funds to pay bills for independent celebration. They went over the budget, but nearly a half a million dollars to prepare for an election. That is what had happened. To provide additional funds to purchase equipment for constituency empowerment in time for an election, which they lost. Imagine if they had put them the pack one. Hmm? <laughs> if they had the pack. 10.2 million for gas that they left unpaid from January 2013 to 2014, non-payment. We paid for you. It is what it is. Even for National Carnival, all them small people, they did not pay. The artists, they would not pay. 535,066 dollars and 27 cents left unpaid by the member for number six and unbudgeted for. Yes. Talking about that, additional funds required to pay the teachers, $1.5 million, $1.5 million unpaid. Those are small people, small people, but they could find money to pay a gentleman manners <coughs> from Nevis to do PR work, political work, and put him on the payroll of the Ministry of Education. But $1.5 million for the teachers left unattended. What about wages on the community-based services? $2.8 million we pay him for his indebtedness. He went to the member, sorry, for number six, took the country to the IMF for the first time in its long history. $225 million. $225 million. And since I became the Minister of Finance, I paid it off. $117 million. Signaling to the country that the moment for fiscal responsibility had come. And never again, never again with a team unity government will we go back that road. So we expedited that payment. Bring an end. Our collective shame, our collective shame of being one of the few countries to have been so recklessly managed that we had to go a begging to the IMF. <laughs> and there were consequences of that. We're talking about non payment for three years as a consequence of that. He did not pay the civil servants their increment. Three years he did not pay civil servants their increment because he recklessly mismanaged the country. For three years he didn't do it. For 19 years, he gave the police no increase in their security allowance. 19 years. No, talking name. about the nine. Mr. You're talking about the nine. 19. When I came, that's what Queenie told me. 19. Understand? Okay. Nothing Absolutely. for the small people. And while he recklessly destroyed the fiscal fabric of the country, he increased the electricity burden by 85% increase in the electricity tariff. As a result of that, many small businesses were forced to close their doors. And when we came in, remember for number one, with a good heart, came to the cabinet and said he will introduce a payment plan to bring relief to all those householders who were left in darkness as a result of an insensitive policy by the member for number six. So there goes, there goes 
same issue with respect to water. That is their history. So when they come here now, hypocritically, attempting to say, listen, man, we need this public accounts committee for good governance, for transparency. If ever there were a time for that, it was when the member for number six was Minister of Finance, because under his lame leadership, incompetent leadership, we chalk up a national debt of three billion dollars. The worst on a per capita basis of any country in the world. Even ranking after Zimbabwe, Mugabe's failed state. Haiti as despised as sometimes people despise what is happening in Haiti and see it as a failed state, even there was better than us, was better than us wow. under the financial leadership of the member for number six. And then one come cry. And then one come cry. And with all of that, there was no need for a good governance agenda. There was no need for a pack, no need, because he liked it so. He liked it so. So for 20 years, he stood immobile, unable to act in the face of what was happening. Three billion dollars, 200% debt to GDP ratio, the second worst in the world, doing worse that Mugabe, Zimbabwe, that is a country, as it were, alienated from the rest of the world. And he comes now to want to give us a lesson into best practices that eluded him for 20 years. And they go on with their song and dance. They song and dance, and the music stopped. Song and dance. The music already stopped on them. Nobody paying them no mind. So the member comes in and she said, well, I have some statistics from Social Security. They said that St. Kitts is doing the best. Yes, we are. Yes, we are. We are doing that. That's what the stats from Social Security says. And again, if somebody gave her something and she didn't understand, it would have been good if you asked. It's good what you ask. <laughs> she comes and she says, well, 3% growth is nothing to talk about. And it is not growth, but it is positive. And you compare it to what is happening in the rest of the world, we are the most powerful country in the world. The United States can't even get 2% good, but we're coming in at 3 and 3 plus. No, 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 that's not good. She forget that between 2002 and 2009, they accumulated negative growth year after year, over 10% negative. But she doesn't understand what that means with negative growth that the economic pie was getting smaller and smaller, that more and more persons would be unable to find work, that in a growing economy, at least you have the fundamental essential for increased jobs. And that is why, because every year on the team unity, we have had positive growth. We know the economy is growing. So when Social Security tells us why you're doing well. You have the highest record of contributors to this in its history. Over 29,000 persons as contributors compared to the figure. And they talk about hiding. She called a figure of 25,000. For 2016, it is 29,000 plus contributors. It's chalk to trees. That is why she didn't give the figures. And then they come to say they have something to hide. 
It's the old story. Mommy, tell them about their Bigfoot before they tell you about yours. No Bigfoot over here. You have it over there. The hiding is over there. That is why she hid the information that she must have had. That over 29,000 contributors and the social security scheme. We don't have to go over the incontrovertible evidence abounds. What social security is saying, central bank is saying, CDB is saying, IMF is saying, Rams is saying they have their best here. Scotia Bank is saying it's best here. SL Horsford is saying it's best here in 145 years. The credit union is doubling up its profit. The St. Kitts Credit Union boasts a membership of over 14,000. Over 600 plus new members have invested with that. The police credit union did so well that it gave its best payout. In the press conference, I said 15% on the share. The commissioner of police said, no, it went up to 20. 20% return. Too good to be true. So all these varied sectors, the financial sector demonstrated to Scotia Bank that got recognition internationally in London, the financial capital of the Western world, noted the outstanding performance of Scotia Bank on the team unity. This is not a here setting on Freedom Radio. This is hard facts by reputable institutions that is saying that we don't prepare and audit their accounts. National Bank went up $25 million profit, one of its best years, save for the occasions when they had this Visa card system that brought in a bonanza and sale. So how is it everybody saying they're doing so well? Ram spending money down towards Zante. Rams opened up a brand new supermarket in West Pass there, creating 84 new jobs, they told me. But nothing is happening. Nothing is happening, Best but down. Best by 24 hours hmm? service. And 24 hours service. And nothing is happening. So you open for nothing. You understand? You open for nothing. 24 hours paying wages, but you're getting nothing for it. And down at the Bayfront, opposite Social Security. The first hotel is being built, and the groundwork has started. An 18-room hotel is now under construction next to the Pavilion Supermarket. 18 rooms and three offices for commercial work. Already started. Already started. But nothing is happening. Nothing is happening. You go over at Park Hyatt, they have over 800 persons at work. 800 persons at work. Nothing is happening. Something is too good to be true. And we could do, go to the country. Nothing is happening. But you go up at the National Heroes Park and you see people there at work. But nothing is happening. Ignorance is bliss on the other side. Nothing is happening, but at Ross University down there now, construction is being undertaken. I think it's a $20 million facility. Nothing is happening. Further down from that is University Gardens. Nothing is happening. Ignorance is bliss on the other side. Koi Hotel, preparing for an opening, if not the end of this year, certainly next year. 150 workmen, local workmen, but according to their position, nothing is happening. Nothing is happening for them. Nothing is happening because the $4 million which the member for number two legal firm received from the development bank while she was a minister of government has come to an end. That kind of cronyism has stopped. 
So nothing may be happening for her. So all she may do now, walk up and down the street, hear say, and melee. That is her new job. Nothing is happening when so many things are happening about which we can be proud of as a country and as a people. Nothing is happening, but we know that a brand new cruise pair will be started. Nothing is happening, but we know that the Bastia High School will be another major project for this country. But the opposition cannot deal with these things. <laughs> so all of this is what they wanted us to talk with, you know, and a simple bill that deals with bringing to the country for the first time the wherewithal to get the Public Accounts Committee functioning. Remember for number two, morning ma'am, cabbage ma'am. Well, I come in here to talk about the music festival, you know, because it's over now. And I have told myself I will wait because it is a national event until it is finished. When did Music Festival finish, Minister of Tourism? 24th June. 24th June. So she could wait, July and August, for one thing, the music festival. But they can't wait for nine months, which is requirement for the audit report, which deals with all aspects of government, not just music festival, not just the parliament, not just the JNF hospital, not just our schools, not just our sewage system, not just the provision for the leader of the opposition. All of these things, an amalgam of things impacting upon the overall growth and development of the country. And they say, well, they can't wait for nine months for that. Well, could somebody lead them and guide them? And they say, but this report, this audit report, only come in once a year? Well, how often do you get an annual report from an audit form once per year? Because the work usually starts when the year is ended. The accountant general is given by law. I think it is six months to get all of the accounts, not just with respect to music festival or carnival or sports or Bastia High School or the cemetery together. Six months. Well, the director of audit can't complete his or her work until the accounts are submitted. You understand? For nine months is pain for them because they can't wait. You see, if they had allowed the public accounts to function, they would have understood how the audit process works and how the governmental system works. They want the public accounts committee, as it were, to become a Niagara House kind of committee. Niagara House is when you have issues on Freedom Radio not at a public accounts committee. The abundance of the literature made the distinction with the fundamental role of the public accounts committee. It is not an inquisition. It is not a commission of inquiry. It has a complementary role with respect to the auditing function and helping the director of audit in bringing more issues of note to the attention of the parliament with a view to improving the systems. That is what the role of the audit is. PAC is, they say, they say that they don't want access to the report of the director of audit. Well, who is going to do the audit? Who is going to do the examination as a matter of practical necessity?
for the Public Accounts Committee. It certainly can't be the member for number two, for she's not an accountant. She's not an accountant, and she has accepted she's not even the smartest lawyer in town, so she would not be able to do it. It can't be the member for number three, for he doesn't know what he reads in relation to the director of audit's account, so what added value would they bring? It certainly cannot be the member for number six who bankrupted our country and forces on us a debt of three billion dollars and force on us the pariah status of going to the IMF for a bailout and force upon us the, u the unilateral denial of the increments for three years. So how can he be on any committee to examine. You understand? That is the foolhardiness of their point that they should not be relying upon the work of an impartial body entity with the full constitutional support. Let it be us. Imagine the member for number six going through the department down there and a civil servant say, you done rob me of my increment and I'll show you my book. <laughs> you could well imagine that. You rob me of my increment. I want to see him go up to public works and listen to MacDonald and hear MacDonald tells him what he has told us. How many years the puppy show he made them take them up to Warner Park held a big ceremony. From thereafter, we will put you, as civil servants are, no lesser position. Stop the honorarium. Three weeks pay at Christmas time. And he says, let me be the one to go public works to do the examination of the accounts. You understand the silliness of their proposition? It has to be independent, knowledgeable persons who will give them the work. And then they will use that work to determine the kinds of questions. And we are shielding them from that mockery which they want to do, and the civil servants. They would be at risk with their history of bad treatment of the public servants. They want to go do an audit. Well, there is an audit act which says who can do the audit. None of them over there qualified. Not the member for number two. Not the member for number six. Not the member for number three. Not the senator opposite. None of them have, none has the competence to do the audit work. And that is why we made it clear in the law. You shall rely upon the work of the director of audit. Because, you see, it's the director of audit to the Constitution. You use it well today, I must commend you. You use it well, Adrian. Section 76. Hmm? That is where the function of the director of audit is, a public office. This is what he will do, examine the accounts. So if the director of audit is qualified, Mrs. Spike is a young modern lady, appropriately trained, is a certified accountant, and the members opposite are saying they can't place reliance on the professional staff of the Supreme Audit Institution. That is what it tantamounts to. They are saying that they are better place. They are trying to substitute their incompetent selves to do the work of examination of accounts. You are making it easy for them. The independent auditor will do that. He or she will provide you with her findings. You then scrutinize them as we would have done 
and you will find more than pictorials, remember for number three, you will find more than graphs, you will find more than totals, you will find their analysis, you will find their recommendations, and you will find their opinion. And that should guide you. That should guide you. They tell you the expenditure, what program. They tell you what was spent last year versus the current one under consideration. Tells you everything. Tells you how much you got for citizenship, the program you are into. They tell you all of that. Capis and bus. Understand? All of that. That tells you how much we made for that. How much we made for housing levy. How much we made for withholding tax. How much we made for house tax. For wheel tax. For an incorporated business. For island enhancement funds. For telecommunications. For insurance. For travel tax. For licenses. And on and on. Her Majesty's custom. Everything that you need to know. Because as the age you said, there is no restriction on access by the director of audit. He or she has access to all books, all accounts, all records, all minutes. So when she or he is finished, it is a proper job. Independent one too. Independent one. In fact, so independent is he or she, is the holder, that you can't remove them. So they have nothing to fear. They're almost on the same level like a judge. You can't remove them, save and accept you go to the process of setting up a tribunal. They don't know that because they haven't read the Constitution. They haven't looked at chapter 6, nor have they looked at, I think it's chapter 1, chapter 1, section 2, chapter 1, section 2. That is why I keep telling them, and they wouldn't take the point, because they want to feel ignorant and strong, and want to represent people with ignorance. I keep saying to them, and points of order. Even the member for Nevis, what number is he? Eleven. What is he? Eleven. 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 You can't just read the act in isolation. Look at the Director of Audit Act and look at the Constitution. All of them give you the legal framework. That is what you do. Complement each other is a complementary role. So it's now a question of priority and which, when they are in conflict, will stand. That is the point. I would have thought that after the learned Attorney General did such a fantastic intervention, some reason would have prevailed out there. When I spoke to the honorable member for number eight, I told him the attorney general yes. did fine, did very well. Yes, yes. You didn't give him my compliment, you forgot. <laughs> that told him now for myself. <laughs> did very well, <laughs> very well in elucidating the point. As did the honorable senior minister, the most senior member of the parliament sitting here, a man who has been a financial secretary, equivalent in the Nevis Island administration, a minister of finance of long standing, a leader of the opposition, a banker, an economist, a teacher. Whenever he speaks, I defer to his reasoning, the avuncular wisdom that comes from our senior minister has helped to stabilize the Teen Unity Administration. Yeah, I and I make no apology for repeating it time after time. And when the 
honorable member expounded, tried to help them. Again, three blind mice. See how they run. They're all making the same mistake. Cut off the tail with the knife. See how they run. Four of them presenting. Each one making the same fundamental mistake. And each of them running the same line. This constitution, this constitution is the supreme law of St. Christopher Nevis and subject to the provisions of this constitution. If any other law is inconsistent with this constitution, this constitution shall prevail and the other law and the other law including the Elections Ordinance Act, Statutory Orders Number 70, to which the members opposite relied upon. If it is inconsistent with the Constitution, this Constitution shall prevail. Shall prevail. And the other law, and the other law, to which members of the opposition relied upon to their detriment shall, to the extent of the inconsistency, be void. Be void becomes null and void. A nullity was a word I heard over there yeah. from a member. This is the effect of voiding it. It cannot compete with the Constitution. So when the Constitution comes at 76, it tells you that it is the Director of Audit who shall A, satisfy himself that all monies that have been appropriated by the Parliament and dispersed have been applied to the purposes to which they were so appropriated and that the expenditure conforms to the authority that governs it. That is what prevail. You can't come now to say, well, we want the PAC. We want the PAC to go to examine the accounts, to do the very thing which constitutionally is provided for solely and only for the director of audit to do. And the constitution, being the big document of the land, tells you so in its very preambulary section at chapter one. We are the supreme, this is the supreme law of St. Christopher and Nevis, and subject to the provisions of this constitution, if any other law, if any other law is inconsistent with this, this constitution shall prevail. The drama then from over there, was unnecessary. And to think over there, you have at least two practicing members of the bar, two lawyers. And they can't recall the constitutional provision. They can't fathom the supremacy of the constitution, that anything anywhere else that runs afoul of the constitution must be struck down. Void of no effect becomes a nullity. That is what happens. This is the champion law of the land. So they can't come and tell us about section 70. Section standing order 70 and they want what the constitution does not allow them to do. But even if they had oversighted the Constitution. There's something I kept referring them to, and none of them, none of the lawyers over there, were smart enough to go have a look. I'm looking for the public account, the Audit Act. The Audit Act. See, it's important, you know, because that was what the song and dance that the Tainos was about. Who should be doing what? 
And to me, it was so simple. With the record of non-performance, how is it they want to be the one going around, looking for documentation, scrutinizing these things? Doesn't make sense. Doesn't accord with any practice. Every other commonwealth tradition where there is work of this nature, whatever the SRO, SRO says, rely upon the work of the director of audit. Just this year in Jamaica, just this year in Jamaica, the head of the pack was under scrutiny that they weren't meeting. And his response was, how am I to meet when the director of audit has not provided my work? He has to rely upon the director of audit for guidance. He has to rely on the man who is professionally trained to indicate where there are weaknesses in systems and any other area with respect to the functioning of the government. The Audit Act. I don't like my copies with the latter marking. Hmm? I can hold it a little bit. Make one more effort. You see, when you have a latter mark, you know you read it. You know you read it sometimes, many times. <laughs> I suspect your mark will be different than mine. Understand? See if you can find the public accounts. Mr. Speaker, bear with us. Yes. I know it was somewhere. Public accounts. Audit Act. This song and dance. Well, it's only one report. And we can't wait. We could wait two months for music festival to cool down. We can't wait six months for the Accountant General to deal with the whole algamam of government departments. Two months for that. You don't see the concert. You don't wait two months, but you can't wait. Duties. The Director of Audit shall make such examinations and inquiries of the public bodies as he or she considers necessary to enable him or her to report as required by the Act, he shall examine the annual account submitted to him or her by the Accountant General and shall express his or her opinion as to whether they represent fairly the financial position and results of the operation of the Consolidated Fund. The Director of Audit may make such examinations and inquiries or additional examinations and inquiries of the accounts of any statutory body as he or she considers at one point in their presentation. They say, but in Trinidad, in Trinidad, they have this committee that deals with enterprises. What Trinidad you have to go to when right here in the act since 1990, the director of audit has access to those accounts, has access. And all that is required if you need it, you could ask him gently, but you cannot direct him or her. The director of audit may conduct an audit of a company, an institution, an association, concern in respect of money provided to it by a public body. So in other words, I heard them out there say they want to follow the money. Mm -hmm. yeah. This is some total and beat all of their life story. Avarice and greed and love for money. So they want to follow the money. That is why you are right, yeah. member for number one. Follow the money to the Baptist health. Follow the money. Mr. Park, follow the money. Because you can follow the money in accordance with the Audit Act. Follow the money there. Follow the money. Because when we came to office, 
The people at the CPL sent us an outstanding invoice from the office of the member for number six, where he took, let me see, this is the election fever. Attention, Honorable Denzel Douglas, Prime Minister of St. Kitts and Nevis. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Over 8,000 tickets for CPL. Over 8,000 tickets for the CPL to give away, to buy voters a fiction for the 2015 election. Charge it to the public post. Follow the money. Follow the money. This is it. CPL 2014 outstanding invoice. Office of the Prime Minister, Mr. D'Souza, please receive and close invite submitted by CPL for the aforementioned caption event of which over 55,000 US dollars. 2015 because it is this. You understand? You understand? Follow the money. And if we, ah, 8,000 persons is the whole part. That is how they were. Buy a code. Buy a code at the public expense. Buy a code by inviting the pep workers down at Port Sante to have a concert. Buy a code by telling them to wear a red shirt and buy the red shirt from the public sector purse so that the party could look strong when the party was a sham of itself as reflected by the outcome of the 2050 elections. In fact, the cost of the ticket was 73,000. Multiply this by 2.7169. Who on we say good at mathematics? When did you turn your hand? 73,049 US dollars to buy 8,000 tickets. $196,000. This is misappropriation of the public purse for any government to take up public money pick and choose who they will give money to go to the park to watch the CPL games and have it charged against the public purse, nearly $200,000. Hmm? Park full. Things good. You understand? And they want to follow the money. Follow the money, yes. And uncover what happened to the 8,000 tickets. Who they pick and choose to give? Be stick it. That is why he didn't want any pack for 20 years. 8,000 tickets! 8,000 tickets to be given out to political hacks. And as it were, to spread a good feeling among its supporters. And then they come here to talk about hiding. Hiding. No, man, you know. Or he would have gotten, he would have gotten a pack in a brown envelope. <laughs> it's 8,000. 8,000. Huh? Across eight constituencies. You see how they live? You see how they live? Follow the money. Because we're hiding. <coughs> we are hiding. Hiding. Follow the money. Follow the money that the, the Commissioner of Police, Sidney Walwin, came to the country. And then you paid him a housing allowance greater than the salary of the Commissioner before him. You understand that madness? Follow the money. A man comes back to his born in land. Yes. Boss of the house of his family that still was up in the village, and you gave him a housing allowance which was greater than the salary 
of the most recent holder of the post. Something that sounding good about that. Something not found in smelling and sounding good about that. And then they cook up a deal at which Senator opposite Senator Carty became the principal beneficiary of the housing allowance that was being paid. That was being paid to Commissioner C.J. Walwin. Senator Carty made nearly $400,000. Understand that? $400,000 worth of housing allowance secreted to the Commission of Police as housing allowance and ending up in the account at Scotia Bank for Nigel Carty. Hiding! Hiding! And to hide it, you know who he told them to pay the money to? The records will show. Claude Mitchum. Claude Mitchum is Nigel Carty's sister. And Nigel Carty was so certain that something did not meet the smell test nor the eye test in relation to him being able to profit to the tune of over four hundred thousand dollars from the duty free house provided by the taxpayer double dipping first minister ever to receive a duty free house from a government first minister and he will be the last minister ever to receive a duty-free house from the government, competing with civil servants, competing with the police for first-time homeowners to get you out of rent. But he collecting rent, $400,000. What if government hadn't changed? and put down the name of Claude Mitchum, his sister, hiding in the garden. That reminds me of Adam. Adam in the garden, hiding from the Lord. Adam, Adam, come forward. Why have you eaten of the forbidden fruit? Paraphrasing. What did he say? Was it a serpent? A servant what? Yes. The serpent to Eve beguiled him. Understand that? Similar situation. Adam hiding behind the servant, hiding behind Eve, beguiled by Eve. Nigel Carty hiding. The housing allowance okay. using Claude Mitchum as the inter intermediary. And then they say, hiding. Come in the sunshine. Come in the sunshine of public accountability. Follow the money. And this is not all, you know, I have the, the list here month to month. I have it. That is not all. Hundreds. Hundreds of thousands of dollars were used to upgrade the house of Carty to put up security paraphernalia for C.G. Walwin so that when he goes to Texas or wherever else he went so often, he could look and know what was happening there. And that wasn't all because when they started the rental for the home had provided for the gentlemen who were responsible for forensic to live in the basement of yes. Carty. Yes. CJ gets so puffed up. She just said, I don't want nobody in the basement. And the government had to ask the gentleman to leave, go elsewhere, and to pay an additional housing allowance. Taxpayers' expense. Over 400,000, one way, 
over $100,000 to upgrade the home with security and other appliances and gadgets. And then an additional burden on the public purse. And they come here attempting to cast aspersion. <laughs> he must have known. Adam in the garden hiding. Hiding. You, member for number one, made reference to this letter from Joseph Edmead to Elvin Mora. You understand? Over 50 million US dollars for Carty's stay at that hospital. Thousand. And nothing like that in the public domain. So follow the money. Follow the money. That was the refrain out there. They want to follow the money. And if we were to follow the money, they would very well be ashamed. Very well be ashamed. So they came here with their pretense. How will the member for number six explain taking public money to get 8,000 tickets to give around to his supporters? And we must pay for that. How would Senator Carty face us with all of our money that he has profited from? How will they follow the money? And then she came here, the member for number two, who profited to the tune of four million dollars while being a minister of the government, getting legal work from a corporation wholly and solely under the control of the Douglas administration. And that is right. And that came in after she worked with Bart to have prevented Miss Mitchum from getting her pension. And she gone and the worse with her eyes open. And she came looking for company with the impropriety and decided there is none. And she came here with her untruth that we, this government, concealed, concealed sorry, the fact that a payment was made to Lanny Davis, who was doing lobbying work on our behalf with respect to the FinCEN advisory. Well, let's start from the beginning. Because if Denzel Douglas had heeded the advice of the US government, there would have been no FinCEN advisory of May 2014. And the FinCEN advisory told us that the Douglas administration was allowing illicit, corrupt actors yes. to enter in the citizenship program. You are right to raise the charge of corruption. Of you should have made reference to that because I have it here. And you could have gone on your laptop and provide a copy to the speaker. Corruption has been raised against the Douglas administration by the U.S. government, and that government had no counter. This is what they tell us. Illicit actors, corrupt actors. Rampant corruption. Rampant corruption, knowingly harbored by the Douglas administration. What is the story of Lanny Davis? Lanny Davis is not unknown. He's a star in democratic circles, a well-known lawyer. And yes, we knew him. And yes, friends of the government approached him to try to see what he could do for us, particularly in the expectation that the world had that Hillary Clinton would have won the election. This is one of her closest friends. And he made appearances to the U.S. Treasury on our behalf. For the record again, not one cent was paid by this government to Lanny Davis for those efforts. Not one cent. I don't know where she get her thing. She said she get it from some newspaper. Maybe it's Erasmus Williams newspaper. <laughs> That propaganda political rat sheet 
that Erasmus Williams um, writes at. That is where she get that misinformation and putting it out as gospel. That is how it is. Erasmus Williams putting out the falsehood propagated by the Douglas Labour Party and then attempting to circulate it. And as she said it, I call because I want to know who up there is to be fired immediately. Because this cabinet, which I train, knew that the services of Lanny were not to be at the account of this government. Please be advised, Honorable Prime Minister, dated the 11th August, that is today, soon as I heard her said it, I want to know what is happening there. For this saying what I told the cabinet, please be advised that there are no records of payments being made to Mr. Lanny J. Davis by the government of St. Kitts and Nevis for the period January 1st, 2015 to August 10, 2017. No payment signed by the wife of the former Labour candidate for number four, Deputy Accountant General Melissa Phillips, refuting the falsehood of the member for number two. Fake news. Fake news. Untruth, falsehood, and abomination to the good practices of the parliament. Not one cent was paid to Lanny Davis by this administration. If Lanny got paid, maybe under them, but certainly not under us. And the candidate who supported them in number four, his wife, produced the information for me today. Understand what we're dealing with? That opposition will not get anywhere. It has no further to go. And that is why when they raise concern with respect to the provision which says that we give the leader of the opposition the right to first refusal, and they said they want it to be shall. I wonder, suppose there was another suppose, because the rate at which members opposite are going, when the elections are called, none of them are worthy to be returned. So we may end up with no opposition leader. Did they suppose that that is part of the possibility of the outcome? Because we have seen it in other jurisdictions. Grenada. Grenada, Queen Sweep. <coughs> And I believe the rate they are going, no guidance with a man with a burdened past, to put it generous, generously. 20 years after, how could the member for number six be leading the party to a brand new day? Come on, man. There must be a redemption song. There must be a redemption song. The member for number three told Dr. Neville Duncan that before he considers succession planning, he will die in his boots. Yes. He will die yes. in his boots. Yes. Number six. Number six. Member for number six. Number six. You were nothing then in terms of the party hierarchy. <laughs> I leave it to his judgment. But he was not counted. He was an unknown quantity. That is the man that wants to be the face of the future of the party. And everything, everything that he is condemned, you just go back to the history of this man. Another untruth by the member for number two stood up in this house. This bill, they never sent it to the civil partners. Made a big song and dance. No bar. Nobody know about this bill. 
Well, our practice always has been there will be a first reading of the bill. We will wait a while. We will come back for a second reading. So who is interested? He or she has the opportunity to peruse the bill. <laughs> Over two months. But more than that, and better than that, I have the evidence here provided from the office of the Attorney General that we, in fact, sent these bills to members of civil society, including to Mrs. Joseph Rope. That is the president of the Bar Association. So the bill went out to all of these people. We sent them even to the NIA so that the Lok Nevis Island administration could be informed formally. This is what we have done. So again, untruth. We have no place, basically, in the House. I want to make the point that we are enhancing what was there. Where there was doubt as to the composition of the Public Accounts Committee, this new bill specified clearly the proportion of the membership to be had from either side of the house. If it is five, it will be three, two. And the three will come from the opposition benches if they are so inclined. Well, you have to say if they accept it, because they are not duty bound to accept the offer. You can't impose it on them. Where there was not a requirement for the leader of the opposition to head the committee, we now have been magnanimous to give that option to the leader of the opposition. We have operationalized the powers to summon important personages, people to pack, and we have also been careful to insulate the civil service which should be a non-partisan civil service from the political brinksmanship and mischief which they wanted. Yeah. That is what they want. They want to be able to call a clerk, call a cleaner to answer. It is not necessary because the chief accounting officer of the ministry, the permanent secretary, and this surprised the member for number three, that permanent secretaries are officially accounting officers. That is what they always have been. So they must answer. They have the right to delegate. It is within their power. They must be certain to whom they are delegating their authority because ultimately they must answer. We have included sanctions for non-attendance, whereas before there was none. That is what we have done. That is why this is landmark. I heard mention of the public accounts in St. Lucia. I called the leader of the opposition today, today, today. And when I told him what we're doing, he said, you're way ahead of us. Because we have no parent legislation that deals with the PAC. We and Barbados are perhaps two of the few countries that have. They're still going by standing orders. When I told him of the things that we are doing, he congratulated us. We are ahead. What document are they relying upon for their work? It could only be the director of audit report. But how something as basic as that they want to defy the common sense of that. The work has been done. The access to the records has been done by the legislative auditor, as it is called. He or she is called in other jurisdictions. The head of the Supreme Audit Institution. So why is it we will ask the member for number six to go back to do that work? Accompanied by the member for number three. Accompanied by the member for number two. Accompanied by the senator whose house was rented to Sidney Walwin. 
This is a serious job for serious people. The pack which never functioned now will be able to function and be supported by the director of audit and the member for number two, who should be a seasoned lawyer. Should have been. And it's now I understand why her mother used to say when she used to tell me, Lad, Marcella, nothing like a Fitzroy. She's too hard to catch on. <laughs> so mother used to tell me I never understand it. <laughs> Lady Anne? Lady Anne, my good friend. She says she's nothing like Fitzroy at all. Too hard to catch on, she said. <laughs> but in paraphrase, and you could say she's slow. She doesn't understand. Doesn't understand what is happening here. So she says she wants to know why the director of audit is not among those to be summoned. Well, Marcella, you're a lawyer. Read the act. Read the act. Marcella, read the act. Member for number two, read the act. Because at section nine, section nine of the audit act, he says, on the subhead public accounts committee, at the request of the standing committee and public accounts of the National Assembly, the director of audit or any member of staff designated by him or her shall attend the meetings of the committee in order to assist the committee. Already provided here, we are not engaging in redundancy. We are not engaging in redundancy. The requirement that the director of audit be available to the public accounts committee already entrenched in law. But because the member for number two would not read the legislation, would not prepare herself well for the parliament debate, she doesn't understand this. Yes, we get to that. This is it. So that answers her question. But she should not have asked it because she should have been familiar for all the years she served as the Honorable Speaker and a member and a Minister of Government and she doesn't know what she ought to know. Don't read. Don't read. All she does when she came into the cabinet was to do a per mortgage document, money for her and none for the people of West Bass, Central Bass there. Now it tells us at section 11, they say that this is the only report that the director of audit will send to the parliament. But the law again defies them. Ignorance is bliss over there. And it must never be accepted of members of parliament that they are ignorant of the legislative agenda and the laws which govern the functioning of the country. It says the director of audit shall perform such special assignments as may be required by the National Assembly or a committee of the Assembly or as the minister or such other officer authorized by him or her so requires. But such special assignments shall not take precedence over the other duties of the director of audit under the SAC. Straightforward. straightforward. Mm -hmm. The fundamental responsibility of the director of audit comes from the constitutional provision. And the constitution says, I am supreme. Anything that conflicts with me becomes void to the extent of the inconsistency. So there will be other reports which are required by the National Assembly. So what is this song and dance out there about? Not about anything of substance. The song and dance has come because members opposite are unprepared for their role, unprepared to serve in these capacity. That is what is happening there. And also in the very legislation, which the member for number three is unfamiliar with, the member for number six 
is unfamiliar with, the member for number two is unfamiliar with, the senator opposite is unfamiliar with. It says, it says that the director of audit also can, if he so desires, submit any report other than the special assignments for consideration and that he doesn't have to wait for the nine month period if he considers it necessary to submit such reports. So that again is in his juris jurisdiction. And the law says that in the exercise of his or her functions on the act, <laughs> in the exercise of his or her functions on the act, the director of audit shall not be under the control or direction member for number three of any other person or authority. Clear? Clear? So you cannot summon him because summon him is tantamount to directing him. And the law and the constitution says he cannot be and he shall not be subject to the control or direction of any other authority. So therefore, how can you put him down there and tell him that you will summon him to come? You can't do that. But the act says that he will be in attendance. That is what this is. He says, so we have everything there. And the arguments that we are having, right, submission of reports, section 8, says that the director of audit shall submit his or her annual report to the minister not later than nine months after the close of the financial year and may at any time, at any time, submit a special report to the minister on any matter that in his or her opinion Again, the professional independence being preserved should not be deferred until the submission of his or her annual report. They came and detained us for two days over nothing. It would have been better for the member for number two, the member for number three, the member for number six, the member for Nevis opposite, and the senator whose house was rented to the commissioner, C.J. Walwin who have spoken with their mouth shut. <laughs> it would have been better in terms of the substance of their contribution, because then we would not have been able to make the claim that over their ignorance is bliss. That is what would have happened, because the very thing over which they keep regurgitating are oh, well provided the rational for them are well provided. They ask us and they make a pretense of having read. I want, and I'm coming to the end, to look at what has been the practice around the world in relation to this requirement that we have here. We seem to be like an ants in their pants. So they have to make a mischief about it. I read from exposed financial oversight, legislative audit, public accounts committees, and parliamentary budgetary office at page three. Legislatures need useful information to perform their representative, legislative and oversight functions effectively. For part, this information, for parts, public account committees, how do they, how are they assisted to perform their representative, their legislative, and their oversight functions in keeping with the best practices known around the world? Hear what the research says. For PAC, the information is generally provided by the legislative auditor or auditor general or director of audit in our case. All around the world, it has to come from there. Because does it make sense 
that the director of audit has access to all the accounts, all the records, everything. When somebody's job comes to an end, the director of audit has to sign off on the computation. When Curtis Martin demits as a speaker, the director of audit has to look at the computation of the accountant general and make a determination whether the duty for concession which he had had been paid and ought to be deducted from his entitlements. That is how it is done. It is a process, straightforward. So why if the director of audit has done that, you want the member for number two to do that? Why? What would she add to the process? What would the member for number three add to the process? What would the member for number six add to the process? Nothing. Nada. Nada. For the citizens who are Spanish speaking, in particular those beloved, the number one. The Auditor General reports to the legislator and the public at large and whether public sector resources are appropriately managed and accounted for by the executive branch of the government. Legislative auditor audits government accounts, financial statements, and operations. In most countries, this audit is followed by the legislator's consideration of the audit findings, which is what the PAC is, a subcommittee of the legislator that is brought together to consider the findings and output of the director of audit. And it goes on to say that you can do the performance audit like they did of the school meals in 2012, with none of the members over there took notice of. They're not reading. They're not enlightened. And he said if the legislator's role in the budget process is effective, the legislative recommendations to the executive must be based on the deliberation on audit findings put forward by the auditor. Understand? In most countries of the world, except in the small corner where the opposition lives, this is what happens. That is not true. This is what happens. In most Commonwealth countries, I read at paragraph 4, the legislative auditor is the auditor general whose office is a core element of parliamentary oversight, and he or she reports directly to the parliament. The report comes to the parliament via the Minister of Finance, and the legislation because it is a product for the parliament, makes provision that if the minister tardy is tardy in presenting it, you send it to the speaker and ask the speaker to put it before the parliament. That is the practice around the world. And that is the practice which the members opposite seem not to understand. And the same principles and patterns and financial scrutiny in the Commonwealth, again, are captured in this document. But I won't tarry in relation to this again. The process is the same. All audit reports are addressed to the Parliament, and the Accountant General or Representative would usually attend sittings of the PAC, which we just went through. And it says that the Auditor General can be requested to do any particular examination. But in our law, it is spelled out, special examinations. PAC receives a report from the auditor. Again, well-established practices. I don't know which page, which document, which world could anything be different about. You turn to principles and patterns of financial scrutiny public accounts, etc. More recently, parliamentary scrutiny of audit outcomes is being promoted by international organization as a crucial mechanism. And I want to end lastly 
by saying, what do other independent people knowledgeable about what we are attempting to do say here? I want to read what the Accountant General has said, a man who has been serving in the public service for probably 30 odd years, and we sent as is part of our consultative approach to government and governance to get the input from the Accountant General, particularly because he is one of the persons who could be summoned. And this is what the Accountant General, for the record, this distinguished, distinguished gentleman is Levi Bratcher. Hear what Mr. Batcher says. The tabling of the Public Accounts Committee Bill 2017 is quite a timely and important legislative initiative by the government of St. Kitts and Nevis. He is in the service for 30 odd years, is at the rank of a permanent secretary, and he is complimenting the government for this initiative, which he says is timely and an important legislative initiative by the government. But he says more. A functioning public accounts committee has been a critical missing link in the public accountability framework of St. Kitts and Nevis on the Douglas. The Functioning of the Public Accounts Committee has been a critical missing link in the public accountability framework of St. Kitts and Nevis. The passage, therefore, of the bill would provide another opportunity to promote and strengthen accountability, transparency, and good governance in the public sector. Diametrically opposed to the non-points we are getting from members opposite who love to wallow in their self-inflicted ignorance. They could have sought advice. A functioning public accounts committee has been a critical missing link in the public accountability framework of St. Kitts and Nevis, putting bracket on the Denzel Douglas administration. He goes on, the passage, therefore, of the bill would provide another important opportunity to promote and strengthen accountability, transparency, and good governance in the public sector. Indeed, the issue of the absence of a functional public accounts committee, I'm quoting still his words, in St. Kitts and Nevis and other member states of the Eastern Caribbean has been a recurring point of extensive discussion on the agenda of the semi-annual joint meeting of public accountants general, budget directors, and directors of audit convened by the Eastern Caribbean Central Bank over several years. You understand that? Welcoming this as a fresh start in public accountability, when the gentleman goes to meeting according to this brief, people are talking about St. Kitts and Nevis and the missing link in the public accountability framework. And it goes on to speak to the duties outlined in SRO 1969 and to say that it is not clear that those were sufficient to bring the kind of corrective measures and other pertinent administrative actions recommended by the director of audit. So what we are doing here really is an important landmark piece of legislation. Welcome by independent people. Welcome by the country at large. And what does the director of audit say? Because she will be in attendance with this committee. And like members opposite who want to frolic in ignorance, the Public Accounts Committee Bill 2017 appears to capture, I want to read it again, this is the most knowledgeable person in auditing. This is the head 
of the Supreme Audit Institution of St. Kitts and Nevis. This is a certified accountant, a professional at art. And she says, the Public Accounts Committee Bill 2017 appears to capture the necessary elements of a bill of this kind. You understand? This is reflective of what such a bill should attempt to do. The bill allows for the Public Accounts Committee to execute its primary function. You want it better than that? In other words, the bill helps, the bill adds value to what the expectation is of the Public Accounts Committee, that of examining the accounts, etc. Section 7 and 8 of the bill add significant value to this legislation. Somebody look at section 7 and 8 for the Director of Audit acting. is pointing them out as being pertinent. Add significant value to this legislation. And she says why? Because it provides a framework that empowers, that empowers the Public Accounts Committee and supports activities necessary at the three critical stages of its work, selecting the issues, performing the inquiries, and reporting to the National Assembly. And it goes on with this, which defies the untruth and the mischief that it appears being presented opposite. Universally, around the world is another word that you can substitute. The starting point of the Public Account Committee's work. The starting point is the report or the work of the legislative officer who in the context of St. Christopher and Nevis is the director of audit. The bill also makes provision for this prominent feature in the process of the legislative scrutiny and oversight of government operations. Commendations coming from an experienced accountant general that served the past administration and is serving this administration. Commendation coming from the director of audit that is in the heart of this. And she therefore could say whether this is ordinary, whether this is in conformity with the norm, whether she had objection to it, but she is welcoming it. And she goes on to say, the advancement and passage of this bill should serve to strengthen this pillar of our local PFM, which is public financial management system, along with improvements in the capacity of the National Audit Office and the quality of reports it provides. Ultimately, ultimately, the bill appears to be to adequately support and promote the functionality of an effective public accounts committee. Well, I dare not call any further witnesses. The case is shut and closed. The independent people who have to work with this have brought to bear their knowledge of the requirements of transparency, financial oversight, the role of the pact to bear, and they have all commended this bill, this bill to save passage, because it will promote the functionality of an effective public accounts committee. Yeah. There's a lot more I had to say, but I will not, because the case has been made. We are actually assisting the work of the Public Accounts Committee. We are advancing the role of oversight of the government. And as the Accountant General says, the tabling of the Public Accounts Committee bill is quite a timely and important legislative initiative of the government of St. Kitts and Nevis. A functioning Public Accounts Committee has been a critical missing link in the public accountability framework of St. Kitts and Nevis. After 20 years, 
of the Douglas administration a critical missing link in public accountability framework has been the functioning of the Public Accounts Committee. The passage, therefore, of the bill would provide another opportunity to promote and strengthen accountability, transparency, and good governance in the public sector. May it please you, Mr. Speaker, and may you allow me finally to thank all the members on this side of the House for their support, for their constructive response to the misinformation, the untruths, the innuendos that have come from the members opposite. They have delayed the country with unnecessary distractions, unnecessary mountains that had no bearing on the bill. They were careful on a simple bill that enhances and promotes democracy, accountability, transparency to take us too many lanes. They were able to take us to talk about music festival long after that has gone. They were able to take us on the path to discuss the financing of private properties. They were able to tell us that they want to follow the money. And we said, yes, follow the money where it would lead us. To my view, it was a shame that the member for number six, after 20 years as the head of a government, could speak to practices in relation to the Public Accounts Committee elsewhere, but could not find one good practice to celebrate about the functioning of the Public Accounts Committee after 20 years of his misleadership of the country. That is a telling indictment about the manner in which he ran the country, about his preference or lack of it for scrutiny and for public accounts committee. 20 years he stood by knowing that it was a fundamental requirement for accountability and transparency. And he comes to say, by and large, that we need to have a robust debate, which we welcome. Their contribution did not amount to much. The fundamental matter to relating to our democracy, relating to the business of the house, was the matter of the realignment of the boundaries. And it was a Friday, like today is, a Friday that he called an emergency sitting of this parliament, hiding to bring in the parliament the boundaries commission report in relation to the realignment of the boundaries in St. Kitts and Nevis. And that fundamental matter to do with our democracy. On a Friday like today, the member opposite Member for number six denied elected members of the parliament an opportunity for robust debate. Today, in contrast, when he had gone beyond his allotted time, we were magnanimous on this side of the house to extend to him the courtesy of additional time for another half hour. When the member for number two had reach her limit with her non-points. We were magnanimous on this side of the house to extend time. And we did it for the member for number three, who came lost in the forest, unresearched, unprepared, unconstructive in his approach to the bill, unwilling to learn, unwilling to adhere to wisdom that was coming from this side of the house, preferring, as it were, to follow the example of a leader that had fallen from grace and who has a wretched past in the parliament. 
so contrast then and now. The parliament on the last Friday in 2015, when the member for number six stood over here where I am now, as the prime minister of this country that we love, was brought into a near crisis by the arrogance of the members and the side of the house. They disallowed members an opportunity to speak. Remember here, the most senior member of the parliament, well, one of the two, was not even allowed the opportunity to make a presentation and a significant matter, and he was a member of that Boundaries Commission whose report was being or was to be debated in the parliament for which we received five minutes notice. Five minutes notice. The member for number eight was named and shown out of the parliament, denied an opportunity to speak on a bill fundamental to the practice of democracy in our country. That is what happened. The member now, honorable member for number four, was chastised as he sat in the public gallery, giving moral support to every citizen and resident who loved democracy. His very presence in the parliament had become oppressive to the member of number six. And they did everything everything to get him out of the gallery to God be the glory because out of the gallery he went to come back into the honorable chambers yes. thanks to the people of St. Christopher number four I don't want to get in the cronyism so late at night because then I will have to mention Alex Woodley in the Dubai office then I will have to mention nurse Henrietta Douglas at advanced age and how she got to Taiwan. Then I will have to mention the BMW brought in by the functionary out of our Washington office and the circumstances by which this BMW came into St. Kitts and Nevis. And the member for number three would want to rise on a point of objection. I am satisfied that there is no need to get into there and to answer every silly point and non-point that has come from the members opposite. I want to say thanks to the people of St. Kitts and Nevis for affording the Team Unity Administration an opportunity to make a fresh start and a better start in the practice of democracy and in the practice of higher standards of public accountability. That is simply what we are attempting to do with respect to the Public Accounts Committee Bill 2017. With those words, I bid the bill safe passage to the Honourable House. Thank you, Mr. Speaker.